to our speaker. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Robert Steiner. He directs online teacher education at the American Museum of Natural History. These programs have provided cutting edge science explorations to hundreds of thousands of individuals in the United States and around the world. Dr. Steiner, who tends to be humble about these things, uh, is responsible for all of that. He also serves as a member of the adjunct science education faculty at Teachers College. He's taught in the Department of Physics at Queens College, Delphi University and Sarah Lawrence College. He is passionate about the purposeful use of educational technologies in classrooms and teaching labs, and is also the co-author of Mathematics for Physics Students. Dr. Steiner has served on various committees, the American Association of Physics Teachers, uh, the American Physical Society. He has a BA in physics from the U University of California, Berkeley, and a PhD in experimental elementary particle physics from Yale University. He is the author or co-author of more than 40 academic publications. And full disclosure, I consider him a friend. Rob, take it away. Uh, well, thank you very much, Janet. That was a beautiful introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, good morning, everybody. It's a great honor and a real pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I hope all of you are enjoying a pleasant and relaxing weekend and that you and all of those around you are healthy and doing okay during these incredibly difficult days. I want to thank you, Janet, and the ECS leadership for giving me this opportunity to share with you some of my perspectives on higher education, why I think it's important, some of its key aspects, and how together we might think about an ethical framework for approaching this rather mammoth topic. Now I'm just going to share my slides. Okay, at least you know that I know how to share slides, so that's something, right? Um, the, um, the, um, uh, let, let me begin shrink this a little by uh, saying that, um, that Janet wrote a beautiful piece on online education about four or five years ago in her book, Ethical Musings. Um, I was tempted to steal liberally from that work, but because this is the ethical culture society have tried mostly to resist. So this is, um, this morning I wanna, I wanna tell you a little about myself, why I think higher education matters, discuss a bit what I think are the, these interesting themes of access, innovation, and institutional sustainability. Um, and I hope spark some lively discussion about the ethical dimensions of all of this. Um, and so my understanding is that I think, Len, you are going to keep an eye on the chat as I may get a little bit distracted. And please interrupt me uh, um, if, you, uh, if you are so inclined. I think that's true for anybody. Um, actually, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a sense of my own journey while also reminding us a bit about what at least traditional higher education looks like uh, with a few slides. So I was born in San Francisco. My mom was a secretary at San Francisco State, and now called California State University of San Francisco uh, in the early 1950s. And my younger brother and sister-in-law later attended there. Uh, you may be aware that California actually has two state university systems. Um, unlike the University of California schools, a four-year four school with a stronger focus on academic research, the California State University system focuses more on helping students develop career ready skills or prepare them to transfer to a four year college. Tuition at the more selective University of California system is that is currently about 14,000 a year for in-state residents. The Cal State schools are about half of that. When I was a senior in high school, I took my first calculus course at the College of San Mateo, a two year community college located about half an hour south of San Francisco. The current annual tuition there is about 1400 dollars a year. About half of all college students in the United States attend community colleges. So this kind of school is of special importance to us and we'll return to it later. I was lucky enough to attend the University of California, Berkeley. In my day in the early 70s, if you were a California resident, 
you just needed a B plus average in high school to attend. And the tuition was a whopping $236.50 a quarter. Um, now it's far more selective and you probably have to be able to, to solve climate change in order to get admitted to the place. Um, I majored in physics and eager to avoid that dreaded real world, I followed up with a PhD program in physics at Yale University. Yale, founded in 1701, is part of the Ivy League, a group of eight colleges considered among the most selective, most prestigious, and most exclusive institutions of higher education in the world. But they took me, so I was happy about that. Um, and, while, and while at Yale, I did my doctoral research in experimental subatomic particle physics at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory near Chicago. Um, some of you may know about particle physics, about smashing tiny bits of matter together and seeing what comes out and, and by analyzing the, the, the results of those collisions, trying to make inferences about the forces of nature and, the, um, and, and sort of ultimately what everything is made out of, the, the ultimate constituents of nature. Um, that my, my graduate work at Yale was then followed by a postdoctoral uh, uh, stint at Columbia, um, where I uh, w w where I was for four years, uh, again working at uh, government uh, particle accelerator labs, and that was followed then by an, a, a junior faculty position in the physics department at Adelphi University, a small private university on Long Island. Adelphi was a surprisingly turbulent campus to be in in the 1990s. Some of you may be familiar with the story. Uh, it was at the height of the culture wars, a deeply conservative administration and a board of trustees that declared tenure to be effectively dead. Uh, just when I was going up for it, of course, um, although both the president and the board either resigned or were fired by the New York State Board of Regents, it was too late for me. And while approved by the faculty and provost, but rejected by the board, I really needed to find another job. Um, there are probably a few separate good ethics talks wrapped up in that whole tale, but I think we'll save that for another day. Meanwhile, I did find another job, a great job, at uh, Columbia University's Teachers College, a graduate school of education, health, and psychology, where I led the creation of the first uh, of, te of Teachers College's first online courses. Uh, in those days, around 1998, it took about two weeks to become a real expert in online education. Now there are whole graduate degrees in the area. I loved higher education and technology, particularly the experimental flavor to the work, and I could work well with faculty, staff, and students. Uh, over the next several years, we ended up developing about 60 courses that were either wholly or partly online, and we learned a lot. I left in 2003, joining the Museum of Natural History, which had received a large grant to develop a program in online teacher professional learning that leveraged the capacities of both the museum's scientific division and its education department. I happily joined, now able to reconnect more directly with my love of science and science education and get free admission too. It's good I can't hear your, the groans from the audience at these, uh, these jokes. Um, Okay, and a few years later, around 2008, I was even able to reconnect with my love of campus-based physics teaching with an adjunct faculty appointment at Queens College, where I have taught regularly over the past uh, 12 years. Queens College, of course, is part of the City University of New York, whose mission has been to provide a path to higher education for New York City residents. I must say that the contrast between my relatively carefree Berkeley days and the very considerable challenges that many of my students face are working part-time or full-time taking care of family members and so on, gives me some real sense of how hard it is not only to get into college, but to succeed at it. Okay, um, enough about me. Um, let's, let's discuss briefly, why does higher education even matter? Um, and I, I welcome your, your contributions to the chat forum uh, on this. Um, it turns out that there are a lot of benefits. I've listed some of them uh, in blue on this slide, but mostly because it's but mostly because it's education and higher education in particular the, remains the key to opportunity, certainly professional opportunity 
and I would argue personal growth opportunity as well. At least in this country, college remains a place where, um, at least in the ideal, students have what Yale President Kingman Brewster once called the privilege of doubt, to allow yourself to not know what you want to do and to have a chance to explore the full range of academic and potentially professional possibilities. And if you are as lucky and as privileged as I have been to find something that provides you with a lifetime of joy and meaning, as well as letting you pay the bills. Um, more specifically, higher education provides a multitude of concrete benefits. It strengthens the tax base, increases median earnings, provides upward socioeconomic mobility, and is associated with healthier lifestyles. Now, I know it's only Sunday morning, so I'm not going to, I'm going to try to not, be, you know, uh, uh, saddle you with too many, uh, too much data here, but I think some of it is kind of interesting. Um, this, this graph shows the, specifically the relation between formal education level and um, uh, greater, with greater median tax contributions and earnings. And even though college can be expensive, uh, this graph here shows the cumulative net earnings over a lifetime as a function of age um, for various levels of, of, um, of uh, 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 higher ed attainment. And so you can see that in all cases, basically, um, there is a, a crossover and that, um, and that, that, the, um, that ultimately there's a, a net positive here that even though uh, high school people who choose to forego college initially are actually er have cumulative greater earnings than others, ultimately sort of in the mid to early to mid thirties, uh, the college graduates catch up and uh, do considerably better over the course of a lifetime. But higher education is no longer enough. The limited shelf life of course knowledge and competition for our jobs from both people and machines means that we need to constantly be refreshing our knowledge and our skills in order to stay competitive in the workforce. This re that requires lifelong learning that we can get to uh, despite working full-time, raising families, being geographically remote, and so on. That suggests the need for a more accessible form of, edu of education than the traditional type. And in fact, online learning in a variety of forms, including the one we're using today, um, has become an important component of much lifelong learning and professional development. Now, the benefits of, in order to, uh, to get the benefits of higher education, you not only have to get to higher education, but you have to also succeed. And here we're confronted with the gap, the chasm really between our ideals and our reality. Not enough of our students are finishing high school, of those that finish, not enough of those are applying to college, not enough of those applicants are being accepted, and of those accepted, not enough are actually prepared academically or socially for college. As a result, not enough of those students admitted to college are staying in college or performing at a level that will prepare them for the world of work. Given the benefits of higher education then, these stakes are just enormous. And as I think we all know, the problem does not fall equally across racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, or geographic lines. These numbers show some of the ways in which uh, we are failing too many students, and in particular, black, brown, and poor ones. And I'm just going to give you a couple. This is um, uh, uh, enrollment college enrollment as a function of, in, of family income. And so not surprisingly, the enrollment rate is highest for the highest quintile, the highest fifth um, of the, in the population in terms of income. You can see that the uh, light blue line toward the top, jagged line toward the top. And then uh, you see the lowest line, the, uh, the sort of the golden brown line at the bottom. And so you can see this is, this is, you can see the graph goes from 1985 to 2015, over 40 years of data. And you can see that, you know, there's a positive trend that the enrollment rate overall is, has gotten somewhat higher, 
um, but you can see that, and you can see that the gap between the highest and the lowest quintile has shrunk over 40 years, but you can see it's still very considerable. Um, this one is again a, a fairly busy graph, but um, uh, it shows you uh, blue is high school, uh, brown is bachelor's degrees, and so this is the actual educational attainment. Um, people who actually got those are the high school diploma or bachelor's degree, and you can see the top half is for uh, black Americans and the bottom half for Hispanic Americans, and so clearly a lot more people are getting to high school than they are graduating from college. You can see the college graduation rates for um, black Hispanic, black, sorry, black Americans has gone from about 9% in 1975 to about 20, 24% in 2015. Um, and, and then the, uh, and, and then for Hispanics from about 7% in 75 to about maybe 15% in 2015, trying to average the male and female uh, contributions to that graph. So you can see that things have improved, but they are so far below where, um, where white Americans are, which is at about um, maybe 50% uh, graduation rate. Let me pause for a second and just see if there are any questions or, or comments that anyone wants to make. Uh, I I do have a, a comment. Um, this is David. I, I I do want to point out something about the statistics about um, college education and income. That it inevitably does suffer from um, the correlation versus causation problem, and I, I I often find that glossed over when people are talking about that. And I I mean I have a, a graduate degree myself and. But, um, you know, I think it, it, we, we do well to remember that the people who um, are driven to complete a college degree probably would be driven to earn more anyway, with or without a college degree. I just want to, wanted to point that out. That's a great point. Thank you very much. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. So clearly, um, uh, not everyone is, is, is able to access college and not able to do it, and, and, and access is very unequal across different groups. Um, and so what are those barriers to access? Where are they coming from? Uh, there's no, certainly no shortage of them. Different schools and districts do a very different job across this country of preparing their students for higher education. The local funding of K-12 education assures wide disparities, disparities in schools. Um, not to mention the ability of affluent families to support college prep tutoring and application preparation. Those who would be first generation college students are less likely to have an expectation or role model for going to college. When minority college administrator was told by his guidance counselor in high school that college isn't for you. And then of course there is racism and discrimination and the fact that most colleges and universities were not created for access. Most of them were created for privilege and exclusion, and we are still very much in the process of trying to re re reverse engineer many of them. And so even of those students enrolling in college, the challenge of staying in college, often while working a job, while seeking additional funding, while having to forego the social aspects of college is a heavy one, with success rates again varying sharply by demogra demographics, race, ethnicity. Um, I've observed in my own Queens College students the toll that family, outside work, and so on takes on their ability to complete their schoolwork. And now, um, perhaps the biggest barrier to access of all, money. And here it is truly the lack of money that is the root of all evil. And ignorance, is expensive, especially in the 21st century. But the fact is that much of college has become unaffordable for many students. Um, 
A 2017 report said that as many as 95% of colleges are unaffordable for low-income students. We all know the horror stories of crushing student debt, a debt that cannot be forgiven under current bankruptcy laws, and one that neither students nor parents are eager to be saddled with. Many, including President-elect Biden, are now pushing for some measure of debt relief. Finally, even if you can find the money to begin college, there is still the challenge of surviving as a low-income student, with many students finding themselves scrambling to keep themselves financially afloat, often to the detriment of their academic and social life. So there are a um, number of pathways for increasing access. Um, uh, I think top among them in my mind is simply making college more affordable, reforming student debt, increasing government support, developing new models of higher education that can, actual, that, that can lower the actual cost per student, um, uh, making colleges more diversity friendly in a number of ways, uh, increasing support services and outreach to um, to uh, high school students, um, college awareness um, and support services in high school that uh, begin that better prepare high school students for college. But of course, ultimately, these problems, they just go back further and further and further. The inequities in the K-12 system um, are really foundational, I think, to much of the problem that we face here. And so as, as challenging and as longstanding a problem as it is and as difficult as it is, I think that reforming, you can't get away from reforming K-12 if you want to really address this problem. And then providing more flexible and individualized learning opportunities as well, making it easier uh, for, for students to, uh, to attend college classes. So community colleges provide a, the major point of access in this country for higher ed, with about half of all students, as I mentioned, currently enrolled in a community college at an average cost of about $3,300 $3, per year, compared to about $9,100 per year at a four-year institution. These two-year institutions generally focus on career-oriented programs at the certificate and associate degree levels and, and prepare students uh, to transfer to a four-year institution in many cases. Their very serious challenges include high attrition rates, low rates of eventual completion of a four-year degree, and high levels of remediation. President-elect Biden's plan for community colleges includes free tuition at community college, a $50 billion investment in workforce training, including community college business partnerships and apprenticeships, and investment in facilities and technology. The fact that our next First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden, will continue teaching English at Northern Virginia Community College can only help. Okay, and again, let me pause and see if we have any uh, uh, comments or questions from anyone. Yes, we got a comment from Amy Cass. My alma mater, Sweetbriar College, faced termination in 2013. It lowered tuition from $55,000 to $25,000, and the college was saved by this and other actions. Interesting, and and they were actually able to cover their cost with that heavily discounted tuition, huh? Well, you know, I guess there's a lot of fluff in there. Yeah, interesting. Okay, and and uh, I'm so glad that's such a relevant point because what we actually want to turn to now is uh, this question of institutional sustainability. And so, Susan Lesh has a comment. I attended a community college for a higher math course. I found the support of the teachers much better than at my regular college. And uh, yeah, I, I can believe that too, because I think that that teaching is, 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 tends to be much closer to the core of that mission, whereas um, other institutions, of course, the, the, um, the incentives and rewards for faculty tend to be uh, much more along, you know, you know, research tends to be a much larger component, publishing and and uh, outreach as well. So Linda, thank you. Linda Bennett would like to know, how has community college enrollment changed over the years? That's, that's a great question. And I don't have a great answer for you. I, I don't actually know those numbers. I don't, does anybody else? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, over the last few years, enrollments in enrollments in higher ed in general have declined, and certainly with the pandemic, uh, much more so. Uh, but uh, I don't know the details of that uh, one. Um, just, to, I mean, I can chime in on that uh, because I know, particularly, I mean, I went to school at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York, um, and they have, of course, decreased their tuition, but like literally, I mean, we're talking about a school that is already at, you know, like to be a undergrad student now, you're paying $86,000. So, you know, the decrease of that is quite, uh, is, is not a lot. I mean, right, we're looking at students who are only getting maybe a 15%, you know, discounted rate just because of COVID, right? Um, and though there were things that were implemented regarding, um, you know, student impact for the CARE Act, uh, some colleges issued it. Um, some colleges did not, particularly right now, as I'm a doctoral student at Ohio University, um, they have implemented the CARE Act um, as much as possible, but they are in many ways still struggling. So, you know, to this conversation is very, you know, of course, it's very home because I am an active student and to see it as well. Um, and also to sit with the heavyweight debt of you know, over $400,000, uh, it is quite uh, intense because you take a lot of risk trying to go to really good schools and particularly Ivy League schools. And we're in, and we've only, you know, we're just touching right now on, on, on community colleges. So I think, you know, you're, there's a lot of things that, you know, I would, you know, just looking forward to, I love what, what, what I'm hearing and, uh, and where this is going. It's, but it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very tenuous time for a lot of us in school. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Rob, I have a question for you. Um, do you want to continue taking questions now or do you want to wait till after your presentation? Uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll hold off a little bit now because I just I, I know we have a bit more to, to cover here. Okay. But, um, so but, then Don, uh, hand it over to me. I'll ask for everybody to raise their hand if they have a question. Okay, great. Thank you. So so let's so let's let's now turn very much to this exactly this very topic, the financial sustainability of uh, these higher ed institutions. In 2017, there were 4,313 institutions of higher education in the US. That was down from about 4,500 institutions in 2015. Those institutions compete with each other for the 20 million students currently enrolled there, about 15 million in public institutions. That competition plays at it itself out most starkly in the rankings of US News and World Report, which is closely watched by high school students and their families. Those rankings depend upon graduation and retention rates, academic reputation, faculty salaries, average federal debt, student faculty ratios, and student selectivity, and more. All of these things end up costing colleges about $600 billion per year. Many of them can no longer compete effectively. Some, like Harvard, have large endowments. Harvard's is $41 billion, a small percentage of which, along with annual giving, helps cover operating costs but most institutions remain to a very large extent dependent on tuition income from enrollments to keep themselves in business. The pandemic has exacerbated these pressures as enrollments and therefore tuition revenue have dropped and as other revenue sources have declined as well. Tough years are predicted ahead with ratings agencies predicting revenue declines of five to 10% in 2021 and with the high fixed costs of faculty and staff salaries limiting colleges ability to respond. As the Chronicle of Higher Education reported last week, the strongest institutions will continue to do well due to their selectivity, due to their strong demand profiles, greater revenue diversity, and typically larger financial resources. However, many of the less selective, under-endowed, or rural, demographically declining colleges will struggle into the future. Many of those colleges, smaller private institutions, highly dependent on a residential experience, now face pressures to merge, with larger and stronger institutions or to close. So what are, what are some of the approaches to financial sustainability? Well, you can increase revenue, you can increase, increase access to new audiences, particularly through online or blended learning, you can lower costs, you can find economies of scale, you can ultimately increase the student teacher ratio to lower your instructional cost per student, or you can give up. You can merge with someone else or you can go out of business. 
there might be other possibilities. As, and undoubtedly, there are other approaches as well. Um, and so that brings us to innovation. What are we going to do about all this? Well, there are lots of things one could think about: curricular innovation, you know, financial innovation, and so on. But I want to I want to focus on one particular aspect of innovation. Um, I think the twin related challenges of access and sustainability really cry out for innovation. And I'd like to focus on this one area that I think is very much in the public discourse, an area where, where the, those two themes intersect and that is online education. Uh, and with a show of hands, I'm wondering how many of you have actually been in some kind of online course. Okay, so I don't see all hands, but I see quite a number. Uh, so that's great. And, um, and with a vote of thumbs up or thumbs down on the screen, um, uh, was it on balance a positive or a negative experience for you? Okay, I'm seeing mostly thumbs up. It's nice to see. Great. Uh, interesting. So as a devoted university professor, I came to online education myself about 25 years ago with both interest and some skepticism. In traditional face-to-face -face teaching, you can see faces, hear voices, see body language, there's a spontaneity and immediacy. One can get some of that in Zoom, but compared to having us all together in person, for me at least, it feels like a much narrower soda straw uh, to drink through. Other kinds of online education don't require participants to be connected at the same time. They're typically called anytime, anywhere courses or asynchronous courses in which teaching and learning can happen on a 24 seven basis. Thousands of institutions are offering such courses often bundled into certificates and degrees, giving a national and even international reach to their campus. Let me show you some examples of what this kind of course looks like from some of the online courses that we offer to teachers um, at the Museum of Natural History. All right, so this will just take me a second to move over. So the courses I'm going to show you are from our seminars on science program um, that I oversee. Um, and that is, um, and these are 13 courses in the life, earth, and physical sciences. Um, and the, we have a co-teaching model. They're co-taught by, sci by uh, scientists and experienced educators that we prepare to teach online. We have partnerships with 10 higher education institutions that actually provide graduate credit from those separate institutions for participants in these courses. And so it's quite an uh, unusual uh, model in which you have uh, participants who can be taking a course like climate change, for example. Um, some of them are about 70% are likely to be taking it for graduate credit, 30% uh, not. And of those taking it for graduate credit, some will be students at City University of New York others at Western Governors University, others are uh, not, stu not matriculated students at all, but are, taking, but are taking courses for graduate credit to keep up um, their licensure and so on. Um, we have about 1800 participating current or future teachers in our program each year. And um, we've actually been doing this for 20 years. So what a year to have a 20th anniversary, huh? Um, I just want to show you kind of, get, get, for those of you who aren't so familiar with online education, just give you some sense about what these courses look like. Let me actually go to our uh, marine biology course and jump to the home page. So you need a username and password to get to this point. And, um, and so this is a course in marine biology. It's our latest course. We just launched it in late October. And so you have a, a home page that basically gives you an introduction to your faculty. It has a syllabus that you can click on um, have to see what's in the course. There are, there are an array of media resources. And then if you want to get sort of a thumbnail view sense of sort of what's in this course, you can see this weekly content listing here. Uh, it's only six, the course is only last six weeks. Um, and the, um, um, and so it's really, it, it's a semester equivalent course. It's worth three graduate credits. And so essentially we have a 15 week semester 
that has been accelerated, squeezed down into those six weeks. So these are tough courses. They're not for the faint of heart. Um, and you can get a sense for the kind of topics that are covered here. Um, and let me just go to one week in particular, week four, do species interact in the ocean, part one. And so um, what you have are discussion questions um, and the, the communications in these courses essentially are a text-based discussion forums. Somebody pose, might put, the, the instructor might pose a question on a Sunday night from say Atlanta. Uh, some, a student might respond from a Boise several hours later. Somebody else from Tokyo makes a contribution several hours later. I'll show you a simple example of what this looks like in a few minutes. Um, and, uh, and so you have a conversation that plays itself out in text over time online. And you know it's, it's interesting. It's different from us having a, a conversation by voice, but it has certain advantages. Um, it, it allows people to think, to compose their answers, to research references. It, people say it, it's, a, it's a more democratic, maybe a more democratic discourse in some ways. You don't have the dominance of the, of the, of the, of the, the, uh, of the most talkative people in the class and so on. Um, and we also have essays. Uh, this is a case study about listening to life uh, in the deep ocean. And so that's uh, Kelly Benoit Bird, uh, uh, an, an Oregon State University professor uh, who we interviewed to understand how she uses sound to study life underwater. Um, there are videos, you've all seen videos. I think we, we have beautiful videos and, and um, but I wanted to show you one, but because I know we're low on, we're gonna run out of time. I, I wanna um, show you one thing in particular that I kind of like. And that is just to give you a sense of that, we have assignments in these courses. You know, they happen online. Sometimes people have to uh, check out, do things in their, their local neighborhood um, to fulfill the requirements. But this particular one is, um, puts data, whale data, uh, in the hands of teachers and ultimately in the hands of their students. And so what you have here is um, uh, that we, we would, that's, that the, the um, uh, that Stanford biologists have attached sensors with GPS uh, uh, loca locating uh, information uh, to follow, to track whales as they go on dives. And uh, you actually, this, this video here is the view uh, from the whale um, looking forward. This is the view going backward. And so if you get nothing else out of, out of today, at least you get to see a whale dive uh, along with the associated data, depth data, speed data, uh, and other data as well. And so if we just do it from the top here, and I'll just press play, you can see here's the whale going on a dive and left is what he's seeing in front. Uh, if you know what to look for, you can see the krill fields that the, uh, you know, this tiny organisms that, that whales feed on. So you're looking forward on the left, you're looking backward on the right, and you can see the data move along in time. And, and so that, that tracker is correlated then with the video. So this is incredibly rich uh, data as the, as the whale goes, that dives deeper, and you can see in the blue, the, de the depth in meters, uh, you'll see the, the, that things become darker and darker. So um, this is, and, and so the, 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 the fundamental scientific question that we want teachers to grapple with here is, how did whales get to be so big? What are their feeding mechanisms? And you can actually, and when they're actually taking in all that water uh, to eat those, to, to, uh, uh, to capture the krill, you'll actually see, you can, if you know what to look for, you can actually see the mouth move up and down. So my only real point here is that, um, that I think that some of the, I think, I think in, that, I'm sorry. Uh, is that I think the assignments are very um, meaningful, very data, you know, they actually contain real scientific data. It's, new, it's, it's hard to put that in the hands of students. The nice thing about a, an assignment like this is that it's usable uh, by the teachers and we make it available so that they can use it for their students. 
And even if you're not taking an online class, it's still great digital tools and resources that you can use in an in-person setting as well. So I just, you know, I, I haven't done our courses justice, but I hope I give you some sense of the media, the, the communications, the assignments and so on that are in there. So I think that it can be a very rich experience. Um, let's see now. So this is, this is a sample online discussion forum where I've, we've anonymized the postings. And so uh, you don't need to read through it, but just to give you a sense of kind of what that discussion forum actually looks like. And so you have contributions from the stu student David, from scientist Sean, instructor Helen, taking place over time. You have the ability to, um, to put um, uh, web addresses in, and, and so it, it can become a very rich experience. There's another kind of course that, um, um, that has become quite popular, and these are called Massive Open Online Courses, MOOCs. How many of you have taken a MOOC, taken something from Coursera or edX or something else? Okay, okay, at least a, a number of hands there. And so the MOOCs are online courses in which that permit the enrollment of hundreds of people in a course or thousands of people in a course, or tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of people in a single course. And I'm really glad I'm not a teaching assistant in one of those courses having to grade the papers. Um, clearly, this is a, a, um, a, you know, a different kind of learning. Um, it's one that, um, um, that is, uh, I should say that Coursera is a company that has partnered with hundreds of higher ed institutions. Um, the Museum of Natural History is a partner, uh, Berkeley College of Music. I've shown some of the partners on the screen here. Um, and so meaningful interaction in such a large group um, seems challenging, but it can, can actually be achieved by connecting students together, by using small armies of teaching assistants, um, or by using adaptive learning techniques algorithms that personalize the experience by guiding participants through learning paths that depend upon the results of computerized formative assessments. Okay, online learning. What do we actually know about it? This is my own idiosyncratic view. Uh, you can do it very well. You can do it very badly. Um, there's really no significant difference in the learning outcomes um, uh, 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 as long as the environment has the affordances that you, you need in order to to teach the subject. So for example, uh, I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, if my next airline pilot or my next surgeon told me that they learned everything they know from online courses, I'd be a little worried because uh, uh, the affordances are lacking. Uh, blended learning combining in-person and, on, and uh, online learning can provide the best of both worlds in possibility, letting you do, providing you the immediacy of an in-person experience with the, uh, the resources and the flexibility of online. Um, it's a moving target, uh, tools, technologies, resources are constantly changing, but that's what really makes it exciting as well. Uh, and there's a continuum of lo learning modalities from in-person learning, web-enhanced in-person learning, blended learning, online learning. Um, and uh, we, we've all put things on the web. We know it's easy to do, uh, but, to, but, to, but to actually do it well at the level of a rigorous um, graduate course uh, is really, or a higher ed education course is really challenging. Um, online education has clear links to access in terms of the digital divide. Uh, not enough students, teachers have adequate devices or bandwidth to get to, um, to the web. Students with physical or learning disabilities um, and uh, lack of adequate support in many cases for students and teachers. It all sounds wonderful, but we've seen the realities of this pandemic and just how miserable and how destructive um, online education can be when uh, teachers and students are not well prepared for it and are not well supported for it. Nevertheless, a lot of really interesting innovative ideas I think have come from the pandemic and I think those will find, make themselves known in in-person teaching as well. 
um, in terms of institutional sustainability and online education, we've touched upon some of these. The possibility for online to expand the student audience by basically giving your, you a global campus, building online courses into stackable credentials, certificates and degrees, lowering the per student instructional costs, and, but ultimately needing to provide value to make sure that people come away with the knowledge, skills, experiences that will make uh, the considerable cost of higher education worthwhile. Okay, now we get to the fun stuff. This is where I turn it all over to you guys, um, ethical issues. Um, so clearly there are a lot of ethical issues here. And so what I'm curious about now, I really do want your chat contributions is what ethical issues rise to the surface for you. And let's just take a couple minutes and, uh, and uh, think about that. And that will let me get another cup of coffee. <laughs> Okay, and let me stop sharing for a second so that I can actually look at the chat as well. Um, Len, I don't know if you want to field anything here. Oh, sorry, I'm not hearing you. I think you're muted, Len. I'm sorry, here I am. Um, yeah, there are a couple of questions and, um, uh, and comments. So first I'm going to start with uh, Linda Bennett. Um, I had a benefit of, of student loans while in college. One fifth was forgiven for each year. I taught up to I taught up to five years. I think it was called an NDEA loan. How much does such a course cost? Is it the same price for students who are taking the course for credit as for those who are simply taking it out of interest? Good, great question. Um, our particular courses cost. Um, $549 if you're just taking it for interest. Um, and then if you're taking it for graduate credit, then one has to pay for the graduate credit, which varies depending upon the uh, partner institution uh, of the museum. And so, um, you know, I think probably for CUNY, that probably comes out to the ballpark of maybe $1,200 a year or so, but I could be off. Um, and for, uh, if, if you don't need uh, but, but for other partners like uh, Framingham State, uh, it's considerably cheaper. It's probably at the level of, um, you know, an additional $300 or so, something like that. Okay. Um, from Ann Wallman, as a career counselor, I can see a trend that is showing the earning potential of people with degrees is not as elevated as it was historically. A bachelor degree is now the baseline level of education that a high school diploma used to be. This is because of the sheer number of graduates each year and increased competition for the quote unquote good jobs. With this in mind, is it ethical to steer low income students into an academic institution when they might have a much better chance of earning good money in a trade such as an electrician? Wow, is that an important question? That is so fundamental, I think. And um, um, again, I, uh, I wish I had a good answer, but I, I, I think that all of you are as well equipped to try to answer that as I am. But it's, it's so fundamental. What is the, you know, uh, especially with the trends that we tend to see within the 21st century, where with the global competition and tech, in, in intelligent technologies competing for jobs that you would have thought were entirely safe uh, 10 years ago. Um, you know, what's the value, you know, what's the, what's the future of electricians um, and, um, and what's the value of higher education um, that they might, that somebody going to a trade school might not fully be able to get. Um, I don't know. I think it's really important. I'm wondering if, if others want to take a, a, a whack at that one. Okay, so uh, I have- I'll take a stab at that, um, if I may. Please. Is that okay? Uh, I was 
because I, I think um, I think it's I mean right I graduated in I graduated from undergrad in two thousand and eight, um, and around that uh, no, I'm sorry two thousand and seven I came out during the recession, um, and I did come from a low low income family. I went to probably one of the most expensive art schools there was, and I was not granted a incredible scholarship uh, to go, but I really, really wanted to go. My parents went into, uh, made sure that I was able to go. Uh, and I'm the person I'm going to go to college. When we talk about, um, okay. thank you. Um, when we, hold on, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, there's a handful of the orals. Give me a second. Um, I'll have to take this in a minute. Um. Why don't we come back to Jay? Yes, well, we'll come in fact, if anyone has any questions, why don't you raise your hand and I'll put, pick on you and you can ask the questions directly. My apologies about that. Um, as some of y'all know, my father's sick right now, so I'm just, I'm actually just tuning in. While all this is going on, I do apologize for that. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, so thank you. I appreciate you holding space for me. Um, so really quickly, I mean, I just think that like right, my the the experience of going into education with you know as the first with a low income background, all of those things, and I went to art school, so it's probably no different than a trade school, right? But I'm also paying a ton of money, right, to go and learn these crafts and skills. I ended up also right trying to be an art teacher during a recession when art and gym were being cut, right? There was nowhere for me to go. And that was a very tough reality for me. In 2010, I decided to get a master's to think I could go ahead and fix that. That didn't work, right? And I got a master's in arts and cultural administrations, focusing on nonprofit administrations to help fund, to, to help to do development and marketing and so on and so forth, right? I think that this is just a very, I think it's a, it can be a very vicious cycle in education, I have oftentimes now, since I am a professor at a university, in addition to a PhD student, I've encouraged my students to be very, very clear about how they market themselves. I think we, ha we also have a public education system that focuses a lot of times on direct, uh, direct instruction and kind of a very kind of uh, micro machine kind of way of still being where college is asking you to, to do a lot more with being creative and putting yourself out and making sure that you can sustain yourself as being vi viable in the society. Not only just be like, you've got to be seen. And I think that this is very, this is a very different, different way that a lot of my students have had to approach their own education of like, what do they bring to society instead of just being contributors to society, right? <laughs> in this way of like, I want you to just be a productive member of it. No, you've got to really bring something and be viable. viable. And so I just often think about that. So as we think about that question even further in the ethical demands, it is a catch-22 to tell someone to go to school and at the same time tell them not to go to school, even if they are low income. Wow, you have such a, a remarkable uh, uh, set of experiences, you know, informing that. I'm curious about uh, whether, you know, you, whether you feel that the, that uh, that you were sort of failed by uh, that oh, hybrid system. I was deeply failed. I mean, right. I, I right. I mean, right after the masters, I couldn't get a job after that. I went to school to go to. I, w I went back into the the workforce because the, the market had changed, but no one wanted to pay for an art teacher, um, even you know, pull out of the butt, pull out the budget for an art teacher to for me to make the the eighty thousand dollars. I was in New York, you know. By the way, right. And so then. By that time, I had to make a decision to move to D.C., right? Came back up after maybe another three years, went to seminary and decided that I was going to go ahead and focus in, you know, kind of a vocation because I had just gotten tired of trying to systemically be involved, right? And then I got my, did seminary, did my great, did all these wonderful great internships, had the opportunity to work with a lot of places. And I became a networker. I became a networker. And I think in the way that I've been able to move, I've kind of moved around as a consultant, being able to give people really good insight on regarding, regarding um, organization, educational policies, so on and so forth. And then, right, having a doctoral of ministry, which I paid out of my own pocket, right? And, 
And then only to realize that that wasn't good because I didn't know the system because I never knew it like that. I didn't know that it was a, a doctoral of ministry would not grant me a terminal degree of being able to have tenure and stuff, even though I was teaching at Union Theological Seminary and things like that. I ended up wanting to do all these other things. They're like, you don't have the right degree. I had to go back to school to get a PhD. And here I am. <laughs> oh. Right. So I've played I've played the game. I can speak not only King, the King's English, I speak Imperial English. <laughs> right? It's, I, I can't say that it is beneficial, um, but I can say if you know yourself and if we taught that in school and you knew how to present yourself and, and in many ways knew your greatest asset of bring, what you bring to the world. And I don't mean to take away from your presentation, my friend, I really have enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that it is very important that when we think about those ethical questions, about someone being low income, to be in this space, even in this humanist space, is also just a very, not everyone will have access to even having that space, this space too, right? Of just advanced knowledge. To be in some, some of our spaces, they're not as, they're not as you know, common ground as we think. Because to study justice, as I realized also was a privilege. Not everybody has the way to even translate those things. I've done a lot of translation work. And that's why we got to be, we have to ask these ethical questions to get back to the ground, to get back to common ground. It, you know, because we do understand how the system works. Many of you do. Uh, many of you are, 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 you know, I get it. Like you you benefit from it. That's not, and that's because of, unfortunately, what we all, which, what, which all have inherited. But in many ways, we have to also sit back and be like, when we ask these ethical questions, we also have to ask the question, what is the ground, what is the ground saying? Because people like me, I had to crawl my way out of holes to be where I'm at. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, I can't thank you thank enough. You. What, what an incredible uh, contribution. That's yeah. so helpful. Thank you. Uh, Rob, Rob do, you, uh, do you have more of your presentation or should we turn it over to questions and answers right now? Um, well, I just had a, 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 couple, a couple slides, maybe okay. one, um, just to put some closure from my own uh, standpoint. Um, and that is, you know, that that some of, these are some of the questions that I'm asking. Um, um, uh, I felt I, I I needed to try to answer the question that I asked you, and so these are some of them. And um, I don't think there's most of these are not too surprising, and I hope that and most of them, not all of them, I think, um, stem pretty much from I hope from the the kinds of stuff that we were talking about. Um, um, and and then the only other the and then I think you know uh, I've tried to I've tried to be somewhat objective in my presentation, but I sort of feel like I I need to declare my own um, uh, ideas, and I think that um, and these are those that uh, education is a human right that I think we really are failing our youth and and not just our youth but older adults too, partic but particularly those from historically underrepresented groups um, and. Um, I don't know how to get at this problem other than with money. And money is not something that's in large supply right now. Um, and that money needs to go toward K improving K-12 and higher education and professional learning. Reforming student debt, I think, is critical. And then, of course, a lot of these inequities, they stem from the uh, financing of public education by property taxes at the local level. Um, and undoubtedly, that's a very thorny topic to try to address. But um, it seems hard to, to um, eliminate the systemic uh, uh, problems without addressing that at some level. Um, and, um, and other than that, I'll just uh, close by saying thank you so much. It was such a great pleasure. It was so stimulating for me to prepare for th this talk and, uh, and then have a chance to talk about it with you now. And so by all means, let's let the conversation continue. Excellent. Okay, first question, Allison Goldstein. Can you unmute yourself, please? Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's my husband. Um, I don't hear you. I can can hear you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Steiner, for your presentation. I very much enjoyed it. Um, I had three comments um, that sort of harken back to the beginning of your presentation. 
One is I remember being stunned when Barack Obama ran for president and he commented that shortly before becoming president, he had finally paid off his student debt. Um, the second comment was, I'm, I'm a big Obama fan, so I'm gonna reference them a couple times, um, was in Michelle Obama's uh, autobiography, she talks about performing very well in school and then going to a guidance counselor her seat around her senior year, or maybe it was the year before, and saying, I'm interested in going to a place like Princeton, and that the uh, guidance counselor dissuaded her and said, uh, you'll never make it. And then the third comment was, um, Lenny and I, our daughter went to the University of Vermont in, in uh, Burlington, and um, she went during the time that Bernie Sanders was becoming a national phenomenon. And I expected when we got to Burlington that there would be this groundswell of excitement, but there really wasn't in some quarters because his wife, Jane, who I'm sure you're aware, was president of Burlington College at the time. And for reasons that I'm not aware of, that college ended up going under. And when it went under, Jane had a very uh, rich, I, I wanna call it a severance package, but I'm sure there's an academic description of what it was. And all the kids who were currently in Burlington College at the time were left holding the bag. They were still indebted and they had no degree. And maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not even sure that their credits were that transferable to another institution. And um, I thought that was really a problem. And that's all I wanted to share. Wow, thank you so much. I, I hadn't, I wasn't aware of the uh, Burlington College situation and, uh, and, and uh, I, I, I share your, uh, your concern. Rachel Porat, unmute yourself please. Um. I had got distracted now, I have to remember what I want to say. Um, but thank you for the presentation. Um, I, um, I, I guess I wanted to ask you, um, I work in, in uh, higher education and medical education and through COVID um, seeing, uh, you know, we're trying to do some things online, obviously, as you pointed out, the surgical skills uh, are done in person, but, um, but I am seeing a lot of resistance um, among our faculty to both uh, this kind of instruction and also transitions in medical care, um, like um, online uh, 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 consultations with doctors. They're okay, but in terms of how to train new doctors in uh, having you know Zoom consultations with patients and things, they're very resistant to how that might happen and um, the deliberate nature, you know, face-to-face um, -face education, particularly in higher education, relies on um, sort of random opportunities a lot, uh, running into a student at the, you know, while grabbing coffee or um, in this case, you know, talking to a resident while you're filling out a chart. Um, and the, so faculty need to take extra steps to make those interactions happen that would don't happen naturally when you're separate places. How do I um, support the faculty in making this transition and encourage them to, to be better online teachers? Where, where do you think, thank you so much for that. Where do you think the resistance it comes from? What's your sense of it? I think it's the change, um, you know, that, I mean, you know, the most recent conversation we had was, um, was that, uh, well, we came to online consultation with, you know, decades of experience of face-to-face -face consultation, and now these trainees don't have that experience, and how are they going to learn, and I was so frustrated wanting to say, but this is going to be their reality. Patients are not going to go back to all face-to-face it's too convenient, it's too easy. And particularly, you know, I work in family planning, you know, if, if you need a contraception conversation with your doctor, that is much easier and more comfortable to have online than to, you know, go to the office and so on and so forth. And there's no physical, physical exam necessary. And it's a perfect opportunity for using the online model. Um, and so that's what our residents and, and fellows need to be trained in 
right? Much more, you know, as well as the face-to-face. -face. And so, but um, I think, um, I don't know, it's, it's um, I think it's just the difference. This is not what they've done. And now, um, now they have to teach it. Yeah, yeah I'm not, I, I think the, um, I'm not sure I have anything very useful to offer, but I guess the things that come to mind for me is just sort of um, trying to, I, I, I suspect you're doing all, all the right things, like you're just having conversations with them and trying to get a sense for, um, you know, what are your concerns? What are your needs? Um, and I think trying to honor their expertise, their knowledge, their, and their, and their, their teaching experience, and then, um, and then hopefully maybe trying to find some examples or thinking about ways in which um, uh, you, you could um, um, achieve the kinds of goals that you want to do in a, in a different way. But I think that it's, um, um, you know, it's, it's a process of, of, um, of, of bringing people along. I think for me, when I started at Teachers College, one of the, my advantages was that I, um, you know, I was from teaching and I had my own skepticism about online education. And when I started at Teachers College, there were really deep concerns that maybe online education is not appropriate uh, here. And so um, I respected that. And I, but it, it also posed an interesting challenge. Could we actually make it something that people we're not just accepting of, but enthusiastic about. And I, I, and I think that now, you know, as, as one gets, you know, I don't know the specifics of the field that you work in, but it just seems, I, I suspect that the tools, the technologies, the resources are so powerful. Um, but, uh, you know, I suspect I'm preaching to the converted, but you've got to, uh, you, you need to convert others. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's a human process, it just takes time. And, and you may not have time. <laughs> Okay, uh, Rachel Herman, you can unmute yourself. Hi, I'm using Rita's computer. Um, so I work in um, a four-year higher education um, state institution, and um, we've noticed that there was an overwhelming um, freshman population that did not like online learning. Um, they really pushed back to the point where we made a lot of changes to having mixed environments um, even now. Um, and also we opened something called University College so that there would be a, um, a specific area for undergrad students. Um, with that, do you think that they should have more of the freshman seminar classes introduce um, the online learning environment to them? Maybe that's part of the challenge. Um, and then my second question is, with the rising cost of um, higher education and the lower amount of money that's coming from the state, what do you think the impact is on student workers? Because with less money coming to this university, the departments don't, cannot afford to hire student workers and retain them for work versus having to find a, a full-time job and not being able to go to school. Yeah. Um, I think the, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure in, in terms of the, your, the, the freshmen going uh, online, if that was uh, a directly result of the pandemic um, or that was it uh, or, or something else. But, um, but if it was the pandemic, then it's not surprising that, you know, many of us over this course of less than a week had to make that conversion from face-to-face uh, -face to online. And the, the fa many faculty had, had no idea of what to do and many students had no idea of what to do. So it's not surprising that, um, that there would be so, so many problems. Um, in general, I think the, uh, whatever one can do to familiarize people with online learning, um, um, maybe in a freshman seminar could be helpful. So sure, that, that, I think that would be one one aspect of what could be done. Uh, the other thing is on the support side, once they're in the online courses, you know, what are the strategies that one can use um, to, to support that experience? Uh, if one can't afford additional, you know, teaching assistance, you know, are there, can you connect more and less experienced peers uh, with each other to try to help them along? Uh, and then, uh, you know, and, and then what kinds of supports do, do the faculty need as well? Um, 
with with respect to the impact on student workers, um, you know, the um, uh, I don't feel qualified to 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 uh, give a judgment in any detailed sense, but um, clearly every you know there's the uh, I know CUNY is in budget crisis now, and and many many other institutions are as well, and so it's hard to imagine that there wouldn't be um, a, a, a significant Im impact on student workers um, uh, under those circumstances. Okay, I am gonna take one more question. If you if your hand is raised and I don't call on you, I can put you into the breakout room with Rob right after we're done here. And this way you can address the, the question to him directly. So for the last question, we're gonna to go to Linda Bennett, please unmute yourself. Um, one of your slides early on in dealing with um, uh, online <coughs> courses said that they can, they can be done very well or they can be done very poorly. And then the third item was, it doesn't affect the outcomes. And I noticed that and I really don't understand that. Um, and I'm coming from this point of view. I'm helping my grandchildren who are in virtual education. Um, they've actually had, I think, five days of in, you know, in school classes in September and this virtual education. And, and I hear and see what they get and it can vary tremendously. Um, how can it be that it, doesn't seem to affect the outcome, or did I not understand the slide? I, I didn't communicate it well, Linda. Um, I think that a, a, a lousy course is certainly going to have a, a lesser outcome, most likely, than a, a good course. And I think there are good courses and lousy courses. What I, what, when I said no significant difference, what I was really speaking to was the medium of online learning versus in-person learning oh, oh, you know, oh, oh. You know, basically given the same course the same instructor the same assignments and so on um it it there's no different significant difference in educational outcome between the in-person and the online course provided the online course has the affordances you need uh, in order to teach the material so and i apologize that was that's okay. not yeah it's it, it's it's Good. I didn't. I didn't interpret it that way because of the way it was structured in the list. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. So now I'm going to turn it up back over to Janet. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob, for a very provocative presentation. We've generated lots of thoughts and lots of questions. Um, I want to thank our Zoom master, Len Goldstein. If you would like more information about the society, please stick around for a few minutes after the.